Welcome to eJournal Club. We're going to talk about herpes zoster and the risk of stroke in patients with autoimmune diseases. Um, as you know, our lifetime risk for herpes zoster in the general population is about one in three, and this is particularly interesting to us as rheumatologists because the patients we treat are at even um, higher risk, and that could be from some of the new biologics that we have out versus some of the old drugs that we use, such as steroids. Um, so today we have a dynamic duo. We have doctors uh, Len and Cassie Calabrese, who's going to tell us more in depth about their published literature on herpes zoster and the risk of stroke, so additional complications to uh, something that we do deal with. Um, so I'm going to uh, bring up Dr. Uh, Cassie Calabrese first, who's a rheumatology and infectious disease fellow, who's going to start off the presentation. And I believe Dr. Len Calabrese will then um, come in and do the second half of the uh, talk today. So really excited to have them both. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Husney. Welcome to our eJournal Club. Uh, I'm Cassie Calabrese. I'm a fellow in both the rheumatolo rheumatology and immunology logic disease department and the infectious disease department here at the Cleveland Clinic. And today we're going to talk about this paper, Herpes Zoster and the Risk of Stroke in Patients with Autoimmune Disease. This was published a couple weeks ago in Arthritis and Rheumatology. And this is work from our group here as well as a group at University of Alabama, uh, Kevin Winthrop from Oregon Health Science Center. And we owe particular thanks to Jeff Curtis and his group uh, who really made this study happen. We're going to talk about herpes zoster or shingles, which is caused by the reactivation of a latent varicella zoster virus, which in its uncomplicated form results in significant disease burden with resultant pain and loss of productivity. From a public health perspective, Zoster is of substantial concern, as Dr. Husney mentioned. One in three will develop zoster in their lifetime, with one million cases occurring annually in the U.S. And we as rheumatologists have a particular interest in zoster, as our patient population is disproportionately affected. This is a rough summary, summary slide uh, that nicely depicts the age-dependent risk of zoster as well as increased incidence in several autoimmune diseases. And the values here are reported as cases per 1,000 person years. Over on the left is the incidence of zoster in U.S. adults of all ages, which is about two to three. And moving to the right at age 50, the incidence increases to four per thousand patient years. And at age 80, the incidence is about 11. And patients 80, 85 have about 50% lifetime risk of, of zoster at that point. Uh, continuing on RA, this is a summary of many different studies, but the incidence is around 10. And Variable increased risk with lupus, significantly increased risk up to 32. Um, with tofacitinib uh, and rheumatoid arthritis, the incidence is significantly increased, almost 40. This is from data published by Jeff Curtis. And lastly, we know there's a significant increase of risk of zoster with GPA, and this data is from the, the WEGET trial. I would now like to talk about zoster and the risk of stroke. And we can look at this in two different ways. There's the older era and the new era. Historically, one in 15,000 children with a varicella infection would develop a stroke within the 12 months post uh, varicella infection. This is primary varicella or chicken pox. Also, uh, particularly in older patients, herpes zoster albamicus or involvement of the trigeminal nerve, specifically the V1 branch, uh, had associated syndrome of contralateral hemiplegia, delayed contralateral hemiplegia, weeks to months following zoster. This is a rare but exquisitely described syndrome and with evidence of direct, direct vascular invasion. And lastly, severely mm -hmm. immunocompromised individuals, patients with advanced HIV bone marrow transplant patients, may experience uh, ischemic and hemorrhagic events with angiitis and evidence of direct viral invasion. And actually, rare postmortem studies have shown this uh, direct 
vascular invasion of the virus. Here on the left is a patient with a severe herpes zoster ophthalmicus, and on the right, uh, this gentleman has the contralateral hemiplegia. Here is an older uh, conventional angiogram showing focal stenosis of a large medium vessel. The take home point there is that the association with zoster and stroke was rare or thought to be rare, but this more recently has all changed starting in 2009 when Kang et al. published this retrospective cohort study using Taiwan National Health uh, Research Database. Okay. About 7,700 cases of zoster um, were followed for up to a year with a uh, hazard ratio for stroke of 1.31, significantly increased risk for stroke in the one year following zoster. Since then, six subsequent epidemiologic studies have been published looking at this same topic from Taiwan, Denmark, UK, Sweden, and others, and each revealed significant associations with stroke following zoster, ranging from 1.26 to 4.52, with varying influences, some uh, separated different types of zoster, ophthalmicus from uncomplicated zoster, uh, varying time of follow-up, some looked at the effect of antiviral therapy, age, and uh, cardiovascular disease co-founders. However, no study specifically examined immunosuppressed individuals for the association of stroke and zoster. And in fact, this uh, Kang study specifically excluded rheumatoid arthritis patients. So now I will hand over the microphone to Dr. Len Calabrese, who will walk through the methodology and research results of this study. Great, thank you very much, uh, Cassie. So this is, a, 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 as the moderator and Cassie have uh, projected, this is a, an important uh, question of uh, public health uh, impact. Uh, and the reason that we focused on this is that uh, this growing extant literature uh, associating stroke and zoster uh, most of these studies had not focused on immunosuppressed patients, and, and in fact, those with the highest uh, uh, risk results had actually um, uh, censored patients with immunoinflammatory disease. There's a rich background that shows that patients with IMIDS, immune-mediated immunoinflammatory diseases, have a about a twofold risk of zoster uh, compared to uh, uh, patients uh, without these uh, uh, attendant immunosuppressive illnesses. So. You know, we here in this room and, and those listening to us, uh, you know, we're actually in the business of, of making zoster. So this should be important to us. Uh, and uh, we wanted to explore it to see if this same association would be identified. So uh, to do this, uh, we used the 2006-2013 uh, Medicare uh, database. Uh, examining uh, patients with uh, coding diagnosis for rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, and spondyloarthritis. Um, the, uh, among the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria were uh, the first occurrence of zoster by ICD-9 diagnosis plus a prescription for antiviral therapy. This has been looked at in many previous studies and has been validated to be a very highly specific way of um, uh, 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 extracting um, uh, cases uh, uh, from uh, these type of uh, administrative databases. In addition, there had to be at least two physician diagnoses for one of these immunoinflammatory uh, 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 diseases. That increases the specificity of it. Uh, patients were excluded if they had a history of a diagnosis of zoster any time before the index date, and um, uh, as well as being uh, excluded if they had a diagnosis of stroke before the index date, and no antiviral drug prior to the index date. And that was an effort to um, uh, exclude patients who probably had repeated uh, episodes. So the follow-up date started after uh, the herpes zoster diagnosis, and the outcome of interest was hospitalized stroke. We actually looked at uh, 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 many other variants in this, but this was the primary um, uh, endpoint. The hypothesis that was tested 
was that the incidence of hospitalized stroke shortly after zoster would be increased compared to the incidence of stroke at later time points. So this would be uh, examined over time. So many subgroup analysis uh, were, were looked at. Um, the notion of complicated zoster uh, was uh, uh, particularly uh, examined. The ICD-9 codes uh, for zoster, uh, there's about 15 of them, uh, and there's uncomplicated zoster, and there's zoster with complications. Uh, we looked particularly at those that involve the head and neck. So it would it'd be involving trigeminal nerve, ocular zoster, otic zoster, et cetera. So the, we referred to this as complicated zoster. Um, we also examined the type and distribution of stroke, hemorrhagic, ischemic, um, uh, 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 multiple um, sensitivity analyses were performed. In particular, I uh, wanted to, to uh, ask the question of whether antiviral therapy um, uh, affected the incidence of stroke. Uh, remember, this was uh, one of the um, uh, requisites uh, for uh, the diagnosis of zoster. So we looked at an extended cohort who were coded for zoster but received no antiviral uh, therapy as well. Poisson regression was used to estimate uh, incident rate ratios uh, and control for multiple potential confounders associated with stroke. And the things that would always come to mind would be age, sex, race, diabetes, hypertension, AFib, previous TIA. We looked at glucocorticoid use uh, in varying doses and, um, uh, uh, as well. So this is the cohort. Um, as you can see, uh, there's two large populations here. One um, on the right, the zoster without complications, over 30,000 patients, and then uh, about one uh, sixth of this uh, of uh, zoster with complications, about over 5,000. As one would expect from a Medicare database, that the mean age was about uh, 70. Um, there was really no um, dramatic differences uh, between um, uh, uh, the attendant uh, imid diagnosis uh, or uh, race. Um, rheumatoid arthritis was the predominant imid, um, and there was a, a good representation of comorbidities. Um, of note is about um, uh, almost 60% were on no glucocorticoids, and about 40% were divided between lower and higher doses. This is uh, looking at raw incidence rates um, following a diagnosis of zoster, um, divided into these um, time um, uh, frames of 0 to 30, 30 to 90, 90 to 180, um, uh, up through one year and then beyond. So you can see that um, in this uh, Poisson analysis that uh, uh, the rate of uh, stroke is increased compared to later time points, particularly within the first month and um, uh, uh, somewhat within the first 90 days. This is raw data from uncomplicated zoster. It means zoster anywhere on the body. Now, if we focused on complex zoster, those uh, more uh, 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 likely to be from the head and neck, it becomes much uh, more uh, dramatic um, and this uh, uh, crude incidence rate um, now uh, increases um, several fold uh, and is significant through the first um, and second time frames. And then after about three months seems to um, uh, taper off. Um, this was further adjusted for age, sex, race, diabetes, all the other confounders that we looked at. And these uh, associations remained robust. Uh, there was a sensitivity analysis uh, that examined the effect of prompt antiviral therapy. And um, on the right, those are patients that had uh, no uh, antiviral therapy. Um, uh, uh, and on the left were patients that um, were treated with antivirals for their herpes zoster within seven days. As you can see, um, uh, there were some uh, definite trends that suggested that um, uh, prompt antiviral therapy um, may attenuate um, the, but not eliminate uh, the risk of stroke, particularly within the first 90 days. Um, and these are looking at um, uh, incidence rates uh, 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 to further assess that point. These again were uh, 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 analyzed um, 
uh, and adjusted for multiple covariables. And as you can see that the confidence intervals were below one. So uh, this is the, the basic uh, analysis that was uh, performed. So we found that patients with immune-mediated illness who develop zoster have a similar increased risk of hospitalized stroke uh, that was consistent with the previous literature. At the time we actually wrote this uh, paper and did this study, there were only uh, a couple uh, other studies. Now uh, there are at least six and, and possibly uh, several more uh, not looking at immunosuppressed patients. So I, I think it's incontrovertible that there is uh, some risk between zoster and stroke. Um, the risk of uh, stroke is greatest uh, in the, the first few months and it is higher in patients with complicated forms of zoster, particularly those involving uh, the head and neck. There's also some trending that suggests that prompt antiviral therapy is associated with lower subsequent risk of uh, stroke uh, as well. So reflecting on this, uh, really now it should raise the question of, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the possible mechanisms uh, that is going on here, that zoster in any part of your body uh, could lead to an increased um, rate of stroke, particularly that of the head and neck. Well, <coughs> zoster is a very complex uh, and controversial area, as uh, many are aware. It has been identified in both normal and inflamed intracranial vessels uh, in patients with uh, and without stroke. And this is the work of the late Don Gilden, Maria Nagel, uh, now um, uh, is the, uh, uh, leading this effort. Uh, I will say that since this uh, time, um, uh, several other groups, including our own, have uh, attempted to isolate uh, zoster from uh, these normal vessels. And there appears to be some controversy, but th there are several uh, uh, high impact publications to suggest this. And then furthermore, in patients with uh, inflamed vessels, such as GCA, in Takayasu's arteritis, um, there have been uh, evidence by both uh, uh, in situ hybridization uh, as well as uh, PCR um, uh, to suggest that um, vasculature and surrounding tissue may be a normal place uh, where zoster may reside. Uh, it, it still does not explain the mechanism uh, of stroke. Uh, it is not believed that uh, this vast increase in strokes in the public are, have anything to do with arteritis. Uh, but maybe some procoagulant effect. Um, limitations. Uh, th th this is uh, obviously limited by the fact that, uh, that we use an administrative claims database. Um, uh, these were not uh, uh, confirmed by individual chart analysis, but previous studies uh, have validated the specificity of this search um, uh, methodology for zoster. Um, we also were unable to extract details of stroke type and anatomic distribution with accuracy. Most of these patients' um, uh, uh, records uh, did not have that. They're only available for um, uh, less than half, but uh, there appeared to be no major trends. And then we don't know whether uh, this has any relevance for, for younger patients because um, uh, this is Medicare data database and uh, the, the subjects are indicative of uh, these uh, uh, the age of this group. So the implications are that immunosuppressed patients appear to be at increased risk for stroke immediately after zoster, um, certainly in the first month, and probably longer in patients who had more complex forms. Current data suggests uh, that, similar to these other studies um, in non-immunosuppressed patients, uh, that uh, there is an attendant re the risk of stroke. And there may be some um, um, uh, uh, protective effect of prompt antiviral therapy. Uh, it would be great to look at uh, uh, the, the potential for vaccines to present this, uh, but in all of these studies, the vaccine rate is very low, less than 5% um, uh, in this immunosuppressed population. Uh, but it suggests um, the possibility that a downstream effect of preventing zoster would be to prevent stroke. So that would throw that out uh, for your consideration. Um, and then lastly, we need new strategies to optimize uh, treatment and preventive measures for zoster, uh, particularly prompt recognition and treatment. So this is a kind of a, a, a further reflection on this. So why do we need a strategy to prevent shingles? Well, um, 
it, it is a, a morbid disease, just to have this, anyone uh, uh, listening here has seen patients with a severely painful disease uh, that affects um, uh, um, activities of daily living. It's costly uh, to us as a society. Uh, secondly, once zoster occurs, um, preventing post-herpetic uh, neuropathy, uh, which is the most common complication, um, is not guaranteed by prompt therapy. Uh, and this can be uh, extremely debilitating. Um, uh, treatments for uh, post-herpetic neuropathy are complex and really not always effective. So prevention is preferable uh, to treatment. This is a more recent uh, um, study uh, looking at the rate of uh, uh, shingles um, with biologic therapies. This is uh, from uh, Jeff Curtis's group, uh, again, uh, presented uh, at ULAR last year and now um, um, uh, uh, in press. And uh, what you're seeing is um, using a somewhat similar uh, uh, type of health services uh, approach to this, you're looking at hazard ratios for zoster based mm -hmm. upon uh, patients uh, being on different biologic therapies. Um, the um, uh, referent value was abatacept, which has not been linked in previous studies to an increased risk of zoster. Um, and all of uh, the other biologics uh, trend toward increased uh, rates uh, of stroke uh, to a certain degree, but none of them are uh, significant with the exception of uh, tofacitinib. Uh, the only uh, uh, JAK kinase inhibitor looked at this time. Um, and these are uh, pretty impressive and data that are uh, consistent throughout the literature. <coughs> Questions are now being raised of whether these same risks will be seen with follow-on um, uh, JAK kinase inhibitors, um, such as baricitinib, uh, where the data uh, uh, have not been uh, as extensive. But there are some um, uh, hints of increased risk as well, and we'll have to see as the uh, patient years of that uh, exposed population goes on. Um, what about uh, uh, vaccines? Um, well, the, the, the kind of the elephant in the room for this conversation is, is that uh, if zoster is uh, a disease of concern, and now we have heightened concerns because of stroke, what can we do to uh, prevent this. Uh, we ha currently have a single uh, live uh, virus uh, vaccine available to us for the prevention of zoster. Uh, within the first three to five years, it reduces the rate of zoster by about 33%, uh, 50%, um, uh, sorry, and it reduces the rate of post-herpetic neuralgia by about 66%. It also appears to have some waning effectiveness uh, after about five years, though there are no uh, recommendations on uh, booster uh, 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 vaccination. The major challenge uh, is that this being a live vaccine, uh, there are uh, cautionary notes, and this is the canonical um, CDC um, uh, vaccine recommendation table that we see every year, and this space uh, surrounded by the red circle is where patients, uh, physicians and patients who, t who have IMIDs and take care of IMIDs live. This is the immunocompromised column. Uh, as my friend uh, Kevin Winthrop says, the, the devil is all in the footnotes of this, and there are extensive footnotes for this. That's a simple table, but uh, I urge all people who are interested in this to um, uh, examine this. Uh, accordingly, uh, this live vaccine has uh, been deemed contraindicated uh, for patients on biologic therapies as well as patients on higher doses of glucocorticoids over 20 milligrams, um, uh, as well as a few other caveats. So we have a, a, a tension here uh, between patients who are um, on drugs that increase the risk of zoster and recommendations which suggest uh, that uh, this is not uh, a uh, safe vaccine to be given once they are on it. Clearly, um, this uh, begs for some strategies to uh, increase protection. Uh, first and foremost and unsaid here is that uh, considering immunizing patients for zoster before starting uh, uh, 
uh, a biologic therapy. Then it's just the best time, this is what we use in our practice, try to have this conversation up front. Uh, the penetration of the live vaccine uh, zoster is very low in the vulnerable population. Issues of cost, it's a frozen vaccine, has to be reconstituted, people don't carry it. Um, uh, there has just been a suboptimal uptake despite, despite direct-to-consumer um, uh, uh, aggressive uh, campaigns uh, to increase awareness of this. Um, over the past several years, and this just throwing out some, some uh, abstracts from recent meetings, um, we have noted that um, system approaches to increasing vaccine are far better than individual approaches. And um, uh, we have uh, thought about this, and uh, I think that all people should examine how do we address this in our patient population? Is it a matter that they bring up, should I be immunized? Uh, is this brought up in every patient encounter? Or do we exploit the EMR uh, to uh, identify uh, patients who need to be vaccinated? Um, in, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, um, departments such as infectious disease have uh, well-defined uh, pop-ups and systematic um, cues to, uh, 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 for vaccination, but uh, departments like uh, rheumatology uh, uh, less so. So uh, we're closer to the beginning and the end of this, but um, there are a number of uh, uh, suggestions that have been put forth in the, the, the literature. Um, uh, Betsy Kirshner, my nurse practitioner who is here with me today, just uh, published a very nice uh, integrated review that ad addressed some of this in the room clinics of North America um, uh, on the subject of how to uh, increase vaccines. Lastly, um, <coughs> I'd like to look uh, to the future here because this is uh, a space that uh, you know, hopefully we'll occupy. There are new vaccines uh, that lie ahead um, and uh, 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 that are not live vaccines, that are killed vaccines. And the, the candidate vaccine that has been looked at, which has been published, several uh, high impact publications in the New England Journal, is a killed adjuvanated um, vaccine uh, that is in late phase clinical trial. Um, this uh, paper from just a few months ago looked at patients 70 years of age and older. And uh, while you may not be able to see all the details, you don't really need to be a statistician uh, to understand the uh, uh, high degree of protection. Uh, the red lines, uh, which uh, uh, go uh, show a risk over time with placebo uh, versus uh, the protected group um, after uh, uh, over four years which are showing extremely high rates of protection, particularly in older patient populations uh, where the live vaccine has been uh, less uh, effective. Mm -hmm. So um, we look forward to a further development of this. Cautionary note for this is that this is a very highly adjuvanated uh, vaccine. Uh, there's a, uh, a significant uh, adverse uh, event profile, not serious, but related to this uh, developing inflammatory reactions, mostly local regional. We don't really know how this will behave in patients with IMIDs, um, and uh, these studies will have to be done, but uh, there may be other strategies uh, available. Um, finally, uh, the, uh, the, the, the penultimate question is, are these recommendations for holding the live vaccine from patients on biologic therapies, um, are they based in data or are they only uh, based in theory? Well, they are clearly based in theory. There's a few uh, studies that have looked at this um, in non-controlled situations which suggest that the risk of vaccine is not that high in this group, but um, not enough to change recommendations. So the VERV trial um, is uh, a trial led by Jeff Curtis and Kevin Winthrop uh, that will be examining um, the safety in a thousand patients uh, uh, receiving uh, anti-TNF uh, who will have only brief periods of, um, uh, of off drug and will be actively immunized and be followed for efficacy, safety, um, um, and overall tolerability. So we look forward to these. So um, conclusions. Um, that you know, viruses and rheumatic disease are highly intertwined. 
uh, as we can see, many viruses uh, are the etiology of rheumatic diseases and VZV. You know, still controversy of whether it may be uh, re uh, uh, related to uh, mechanisms of certain forms of vasculitis. It certainly uh, can be comor comor comorbid condition. The patient has zoster, really interrupts their therapy for whatever, because uh, it's hard to get over this without stopping immunosuppression. And complication is what we are now considering it is a complication of our therapy. Um, this relationship is not simple. Uh, it's often combinatorial, um, as, uh, as uh, I think uh, uh, it's easy to understand. And uh, mostly, uh, physicians who take care of IMIDs must stay informed on uh, clinical and basic research in this area for diagnosis, management, and prevention.